everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Happy New Year. I sincerely hope that you had a great holiday season. Let's get you caught up now on what's happening around San Diego. We'll also look ahead at what's to come. By far, though, our top story this week, holiday travel. A deadly winter storm forced thousands of flight delays and cancellations. While many airlines have recovered, Southwest is still playing catch up. It scrapped 70% of its flights on Monday and 60% on Tuesday. The hope, the goal is to get back to normal by Friday. The travel snafu led to long lines at airports across the country as people scrambled to get home. And now the U.S. Department of Transportation says that it's looking into the mess. President Biden even saying that his administration is working to ensure airlines are held accountable. CBS 8's Richard Allen tells us how the federal government is responding and how Southwest CEO is working with Washington. Well, that's right. The U.S. Department of Transportation says it plans to launch an investigation into Southwest Airlines, and they're not the only ones who want answers. We all want answers. It's like, what's going on? Why are you selling something that you're not providing? Claudia Berber and her husband managed to rent a car to drive back to San Jose after Southwest canceled their flight home. We are left struggling here, stranded, and we're expected to be back at work tomorrow. So far, she's been offered a voucher for her canceled flight. I want my money back. I don't think I want to deal with this again. <laughs> Kevin Eaton also ended up driving a rental car from Sacramento back home to San Diego after Southwest canceled his flight as well. I've saved my gas receipts, hopefully I can get a little reimbursement there. But questions on refunds and reimbursements have yet to receive specific answers. I tried calling them last night and there's just no way through. It's been a struggle trying to get a hold of them. The lines are busy. That struggle continues at San Diego International, where Sid and Adam were supposed to fly out to Nashville on Christmas Eve and are finally making making it out three days later for a postponed holiday gathering with mom. She's cooking right now, like getting everything ready. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully we make the flight. We make it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a waiting game. It's a waiting game. Jen Hart and her family, including four grandkids from six years down to five months, are praying their flight to Denver, already delayed, doesn't end up on this growing list of cancellations. And you wait for the announcement, you hope it's you. They need to take care of their passengers and their employees, given what's happened across their system these last days. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg is calling for an investigation into what caused, in his words, this meltdown at Southwest Airlines. Because what we're seeing right now from the system and the flights themselves uh, to the inability to reach anybody on a customer service phone line is just completely unacceptable. Please also hear that I'm truly sorry. Southwest CEO, in the meantime, says he reached out to Buttigieg earlier today. We're doing everything we can to return to a normal operation. And Southwest CEO also says they plan to fly a reduced schedule over the next few days and are optimistic they'll be back on track before next week, adding, quote, these past few days will not be part of our future. Yeah, again, hope you are safe and sound. If only Christmas were in July, right? Well, meantime, health experts are bracing for what they're expecting to be a strong comeback of COVID, flu, and RSV cases by the end of the week. Case numbers are expected to remain high then for two weeks following holiday gatherings and travel. The increase in cases is driving demand for children's medicines. Some pharmacy shelves are empty. CVS, Target, and Walgreens are among stores now limiting purchases of over-the-counter meds to prevent stockpiling. And the San Diego Blood Bank has hit a dangerously low blood supply and it needs our help. Officials are urging the community to donate. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez shares why a supply chain shortage is creating new problems for the local blood bank. The San Diego Blood Bank typically likes to have a seven-day supply of all blood types. As of tonight, they have about one and a half days. They tell me hitting just one day would be considered a critical level. If that blood's not available for a hospital patient on the table, it could be really detrimental outcomes. Which is why Claudine Van Gonka with the San Diego Blood Bank is calling on the community to help. She says donations tend to slow down during the holidays, but this year supply chain issues have created another obstacle. We are completely out of these special kits that are used specifically to collect uh, blood from people who do what we call double reds, which is essentially uh, two donations in one. This means the blood bank needs double the single unit donations to make up for it. 
They're needing about 1,000 donors to step up in the next two weeks. It feels good. I mean, that's why I make it a priority. Donors like Justin Scully are answering the call. I'm a O negative, so I'm a universal donor. So they call me all the time. So like literally the day that like I'm available to donate, they start calling me. So I realized it was pretty important. Knowing a single donation can save up to three lives keeps him coming back. I think like if they could just connect to the bigger picture and imagine the people that they're helping, um, they could, you know, get over the little prick that they have to fill. Anyone who is at least 17 years old or older, is healthy and at least 114 pounds, is eligible to donate. Visit CBS8.com to learn more. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS8. I'm a frequent donor, so good stuff, Jasmine. Thanks. Well, as we get ready to ring in the new year here in San Diego, the CHP California Highway Patrol wants people out celebrating to know that they will also be out on the roads in full force. The maximum enforcement period starts Friday night at 6 through January 2nd. CBS 8's Anne Marie Spaulding got to ride along with officers and shows us how they're keeping us safe. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's exciting, right, having a new year, bringing in the new year. Um, but at the same time, it's just bringing the new year safely and celebrate responsibly. Happy new year! It's scary to think, you know, that obviously, you know, families out there, you know, driving on the roadways. It's scary to think, you know, that there's other people out there that are possibly have made that wrong decision, have consumed alcohol or drugs and decided to get behind the wheel. I'm Officer Juan Escobar. I'm the Public Information Officer for the California Highway Patrol. Just last year, during this time period, the maximum enforcement period, there was uh, 29 people that died across the state, you know, from uh, traffic collisions. I have a plan, designated a silver driver. You know, we understand you know, people are going to celebrate, uh, have a good time. I'm not saying don't, have a good time. But at the same time, just be responsible. If you have consumed alcohol, please do not get behind the wheel. You're risking a lot. You're risking your liberty. Uh, if you do get into an accident and you hurt someone, um, if you kill someone, I mean, you're going to be going to prison for for a long time. We got all available officers out on our local freeways, right? There's one of uh, our highway patrol officers up ahead. And so a lot of the things that we're looking for in impaired drivers we're looking for their different clues, you know, their ability to stay within within their lane. If they're weaving, if they're going outside of the, the lanes, I mean, that's, that's a clue that we're looking for. We'll make an enforcement stop on that uh, driver and then, you know, talk to the driver and, and determine whether or not that person may or may not be under the influence. Our biggest goal is to make sure, you know, that everybody's out here driving safely, making sure our roadways are safe, and we don't lose anybody over the holiday weekend because of a bad decision. Yeah, well said. Stay safe. And starting next week, California will be the first state in the nation to eliminate the requirement for parking as part of new housing built near mass transit. Supporters say this will help reduce the rising cost of housing while encouraging alternatives to California's car culture. CBS 8's Richard Allen has more on how this new law will work, as well as the concerns some residents are already raising. Well, that's right. Governor Newsom calls this new law a win-win, promising to reduce housing costs for Californians while also helping to reduce emissions from cars, tackling the housing crisis and the climate crisis at the same time. Basically, we're making it cheaper and easier to build new housing near daily destinations like jobs and grocery stores and schools. Assembly Bill 2097, officially signed into law this fall, will prohibit minimum parking space requirements for new housing and commercial developments that are located within a half mile of mass transit. This means more housing at lower prices, closer to walkable neighborhoods and public transit. Currently, developers on a statewide level are required to provide a minimum amount of off-street parking with each unit they construct, which drives up their cost by about $36,000 per apartment. Assemblymember Laura Friedman, who authored the legislation, points out that in some cases it can cost as much as $80,000 additionally per unit. So it becomes very expensive, and of course that cost is passed directly on to the renters or to the buyers. She also points out the impact this legislation 
legislation will have on climate change by encouraging Californians to be less reliant on cars and focus on more sustainable modes of transportation. So this is also about, you know, answering the question of what do we do about all the cars and all the parking with how about we run more meaningful, convenient, safe mass transit in our cities and focus on that. Well, I love the idea of encouraging mass transit. Carlsbad residents Laura Hunterberg and Nick Prendergast are on board with this new legislation and what it's aiming to accomplish. The only problem with that is that we need more mass transit. We're from North County and we can only use the coast to come down here because the transit doesn't go to where we are in Carlsbad. Concerns have also been raised whether fewer on-site parking spaces will lead to more drivers parking their cars on the street. So we already see everyone parking on the street, irritating the developments next to us because we're all, all parked up their street. Mm -hmm. I think you really need something to go that last half mile, otherwise people are just going to park everywhere. Still, they're hopeful more Californians will embrace this idea of opting for alternatives to cars in the coming years. Definitely. We would love to use mass transit more often if we had that opportunity. If there was more infrastructure, I would be much more a proponent of doing it as well. And AB 2097 goes into effect as state law beginning January 1st. For more information, just go to CBS8.com, click on the online version of this story. Richard, thanks. Well, the new year will also bring some changes for California's workers. Starting January 1st, the statewide minimum wage will go up to $15.50 an hour, although it is going up to $16.30 in the city of San Diego. Also, almost all companies will have to include salary ranges on job postings, and another law is expanding union rights for farm workers by allowing them to vote in union elections through ballot cards. Protection for farm workers it is key. They're mostly undocumented. Family members work at the same farm. The moment they start uh, saying that they want a union or asking for their rights, they're fired. That cannot continue to happen. Yeah, and a law to establish a fast food regulatory council was set to go into effect, but legal challenges may delay its launch. And again, new year, new laws, some new health care laws as well. They cover everything from abortion care to gender affirming care. Our political reporter Morgan Reiner continues our 2023 coverage. There's Care Court, which is Governor Gavin Newsom's big plan to address the homeless crisis. It will provide mental health and substance use disorder treatment to those exhibiting signs of severe mental illness. Only seven counties, though, have to implement it within 2023, and that includes San Diego County. Under Governor Gavin Newsom's new Care Corps plan, a judge can order a treatment for up to two years, which may include medication, housing, and therapy for those exhibiting severe mental illness. Congratulations, everybody. These seven counties are required to put the plan in place by October 2023. Hard work is realized at the local level. There are several new laws in 2023 that are aimed at increasing access to abortion and reproductive health care. SB 1375 gives qualified nurse practitioners and certified midwives the ability to perform first trimester abortions without supervision of a physician. And part of this is because we are getting an influx of women from some other states that are very restrictive. Right. They are coming into California to get uh, abortion services. SB 1142 created an abortion support fund to help women with the logistical expense of getting an abortion, and California put $20 million into it. Really help to um, help people get to their appointments, as well as provide other support, um, including child care, travel, lodging, um, anything else that they might need to access um, not just abortion care, but um, reproductive health care here in California. SB 367, known as the Campus Opioid Safety Act, aims to reduce opioid-related deaths by having overdose reversal medication like naloxone on campus. Under the law, the California Department of Public Health also has to provide educational and preventative information about opioid overdoses to all college and university campuses as part of their student orientation process. There's also a bill from Senator Scott Weiner aimed at making California a sanctuary state for gender affirming care. It will protect transgender people, including children and their parents, from any legal action in other states where there are bans and restrictions in place. Morgan Reiner there, thank you. Now over the past few days, hundreds of migrants have been left stranded at San Diego bus stations by Customs and Border Protection officers. But activists think the drop-offs are politically motivated. Meanwhile, people seeking asylum are caught in the middle. CBS 8's Regina Urita talked with one man who came from Colombia to El Cajon, who says he's thankful to have made it to the U.S. 
Just last night, we noticed over a dozen of migrants being loaded up onto another bus at the San Ysidro port of entry. While these migrant drop offs are not uncommon, activists say what's concerning is the frequent amount of migrants being left at bus stations. 200 pesos mexicano es lo único que me acompaña. With only 200 Mexican pesos to his name, Francisco Goya, a Colombian migrant who for months had been waiting in Tijuana for asylum, was thrilled to hear that he was granted asylum and was led into the U.S. from the San Isidro port of entry. Para llegar aquí fue algo... Goya says that's where he and dozens of others were loaded onto a bus and dropped off at the El Cajon Transit Center by Customs and Border Protection earlier today. While many migrants feel fortunate to make it into the U.S., activists say migrants are being left stranded at drop-off locations with no support or resources and are blaming the Department of Homeland Security for the lack of support. It exposes them, it places them at the uh, risk of uh, of being uh, harmed by people that are seeking to exploit them. Local activist Pedro Rios says the frequent drop-offs carrying a multitude of migrants to a location with no resources only shows the unfair treatment migrants experience. Rios also believes there could be political motivations. This comes at the same time that the Supreme Court has decided the future of Title 42, a policy that has expelled thousands of migrants seeking asylum back to their country. But even with Title 42 in place, migrants continue to cross. The Department of Homeland Security has done a better job in the past. We've seen the efficiency that it that it uh, used to uh, support Ukrainian migrants. Rios adds that it's unfortunate that the Biden administration in its two years of being in the White House did not develop a plan to ensure that at the end of Title 42, migrants could be welcomed with dignity. Now, we did reach out to CBP to ask why more migrants are being dropped off more than usual, but they have yet to respond to our request for an interview. Regina Yurita, CBS 8. Yeah, and stay with CBS8.com for developments. Well, 36 years ago, on December 27, 1986, a 20-year-old San Diego State student was murdered by an on-duty California Highway Patrol officer in North County. After strangling Karen Knott and dumping her body off of the 15 freeway, Officer Craig Pyre continued his shift as if nothing had happened. In this story from the CBS 8 archives, we look back at the case after two trials as our Chris Saunders reported. It was three days after Christmas, 1986, a deserted, lonely area under the I-15 freeway at Mercy Road, an exit that led nowhere. That's where police found the lifeless body of Karen Knott, a pretty San Diego State honor student whose family had been frantically searching for her all night. She had been strangled, her body tossed off the old Highway 395 bridge. Police found the body after family members spotted the Volkswagen early on the morning of the 28th. The main unanswered question is, uh, is how she was able to be either duped or, or conned into stopping, and we don't know why. Knott's anguished family made several appeals to the public to help solve the brutal murder, which no one could understand. At the time, though no one came forward who'd seen anything the night of the killing, several women called police and said they'd had an unusual experience with a highway patrol officer who'd pulled them off the freeway and spent an hour or more, in some cases, talking to them about personal things. The stops all had two things in common. They were at Mercy Road, and the officer was Craig Pyre. I know. I didn't even do it. It was two and a half weeks after the murder that homicide detectives went to Pyre's Poway home and led him away in handcuffs. That a highway patrolman would be charged with murder was as shocking to the community as Karen Knott's murder had been. As he was leaving, I said, it must, it must have been quite a night for you. And he said, it was one hell of a night. At the trial, Craig Pyre sat silently through weeks of testimony as prosecutor Joe Van Orschoven wove a case that was largely circumstantial. Scratches on Pyre's face, a rope in the trunk of his CHP car, which could have been used to strangle Knott, the women who testified about their odd encounters with Pyre, fibers in Knott's fingernails, which could have come from Pyre's uniform, and a medical examiner who contradicted himself in testifying about Knott's autopsy. Two other prosecution witnesses, surprise witnesses who came forward during the trial, gave shaky accounts of how they allegedly saw Pyre pull over a white Volkswagen like Kara Knott's the night of the murder. Defense attorney Robert Grimes skillfully sowed the seeds of doubt in the jury's mind with his low-key style. In the end, he'd done his job. The jury was out seven days wrestling with the decision, and they came back deadlocked seven to five in favor of conviction. Uh, trying to reach a decision in this case. No. Judge Richard Huffman declared a mistrial. 
Afterwards, the jury foreman summed up the experience. A lot of us felt, felt <sighs> that we failed. For the retrial, D.A. Ed Miller appointed a new prosecutor, Paul Finks, a former Brooklyn prosecutor who specialized in murder cases and had a high conviction rate. Like Grimes, Finks has a low-key, effective style. It appeared at the start of the second trial that the attorneys were evenly matched in this very difficult case. Every day of the trial has been like attending Kara's funeral over and over and over again and reliving the agony of her horrible murder. Until Kara's murder is convicted, we will not be able to pull our lives back together again. Chris Saunders, News 8. And now to an Earth Day. You may be wondering where your green trash bin is if you live in the city of San Diego. We were supposed to start composting as a community just this past summer. But as CBS 8's Neda Aranpour shows us, the rollout has been del delayed. Now we can expect to start recycling our food and yard waste by early 2023. All of these trash bins are stacked up and ready to roll out. Tens of thousands of them. This is actually a couple thousand right here behind me. Yeah, and so we have 267,000 upwards of that to get out the door over six months. It is quite the undertaking, according to Conrad Ware, the deputy director of the Collection Services Division. They serve the city of San Diego, nearly 300,000 people who will soon change the way they throw away their trash. We will be rolling out these green bins to the front of everybody's yard um, in the street, not actually on your property. Those bins will also come with a smaller kitchen pail where you can throw your food waste before dumping it into the larger bins. These are all 95 gallon um, green organic waste bins that will be delivered to residents who are going to receive them. So we actually have three sizes, 95, 65 and 35 that will go out to different people. What if you don't know how much organic waste you might go through? Yeah, great, great question. So we're actually offering all of our residents an ability to swap out. You're also being asked to dump your yard waste into these same green bins. These bins are designed to be allowed to be picked up by our sanitation vehicles. Those old uh, little round bins, um, those are manual collection um, and those will not be used anymore. As for what type of food to dump, well, banana peels and watermelon core, rice, beans, bones, bread, cheese, even paper towels are all okay. Just nothing that is cleaning spray or other hazards. That includes no human waste and no pet waste. Definitely no bags, even if they say compost on them. So it could end up with thousands of tons of green organic matter diverted from our landfill. Ware says this could mean four to 11 pounds less going into our landfills per household per week. And that's the real goal is to prevent that methane from being released and helping us to support our climate action uh, plan. In 2016, voters approved a bill to require all of the state to recycle organic waste. San Diego was going to start in summer of 2022, but the city says they were dealing with supply chain and manufacturing delays as they waited on on new trucks, which along with these bins will also roll out in January. Sanitation workers will take the green bins to the Miramar landfill, where they won't use your typical compost system with worms. Instead, it'll be tarped over and aerated. That'll prevent methane from spewing into our atmosphere, something Ware says has been years in the making. And the end result, free composted soil, turning our waste into valuable nourishment for our plants. A full circle concept, taking food and plants and eventually using them to create more. For Earth 8, I'm Netta Iranpour. Netta, thank you. And it'll take a while to roll out all 260,000 bins. So by July of 2023, the city then expects people who use their services to have a green bin and a kitchen pail. You'll start to get mailers a few weeks before the bins arrive. If you'd like to change the size of your bin, you can request a change in the Get It Done app. Well, San Diego County home prices dropped for the sixth straight month, according to data tracking service CoreLogic. Their numbers show the median home price across the county was about $765,000 in November. That's down $85,000 from May. The number of homes being sold is also going down, and real estate experts blame record high pricing. If you want to sell, you're going to have to come down, and that's just the bottom line. So the most motivated sellers are going to drop their price until they find the right buyer. 
Yeah, analysts tracking these changes say prices are moderating and they expect it to continue. But if the numbers continue to go down, people who bought at the height of the market will see their home values decline. Well, a well-known San Diego artist painted her first rainbow at the age of two and never looked back. So as we take you into the Zevely zone, Jeff is in Bankers Hill, where the Casablanca building is getting a very colorful makeover. When this historic apartment complex needed a splash of color, the building's owner knew just who to call. I've been obsessed with color my whole life. It's always been big, bright colors. Ooh, ooh. Sarah Stiber up, up. Airplane. might just be San Diego's most colorful character. You have a thing for color. Yes, I do. Who else would pull yeah. an all-nighter? Well, I couldn't just use the plain white dickies that I got in the mail. To tie-dye a jumpsuit for this colorful <laughs> close-up. Was that my close-up? <laughs> Sarah told us about a video <laughs> her mother shot of her when she was just two years old. I got a when she decided to become an artist forever. Looking at that early footage, I don't think I was like quite as um, specific with my lines as I am maybe now. So. <laughs> After studying art at Boston College, Sarah became a professional. We found other video where you're in a house painting walls. Is that your house? Yes. That's my house. Sarah thought, why should art be confined to a canvas? She became an interior designer too. The walls were beige. They were all beige. And that doesn't work for you. I don't like beige. Which leads us to Fourth Avenue on Bankers Hill. This is Casablanca, which I find the name very ironic because as you can see, it is a lot less Blanca. <laughs> Casablanca is an apartment complex built in the early 1900s to house the workers who built the Panama California Expo. When the building's owner, FNF Properties, needed a little pizzazz, Sarah was ready to go up, up, and away. Welcome to my office, so high off the ground. Uh, it's not bad, it has an ocean view. It's my largest mural I've ever done. You can see it expands like a full city block. And yeah, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Her project is part of a series of paintings she's calling Rainbow Ribbon Magic. Like a year ago, I never would have thought that I would be up 60 foot on a boom lift painting. Casablanca may just be her masterpiece. I have all of my paint and studio furniture with me up here, and it's like my studio in the sky. Here's looking at you. I feel like I got to pursue my wildest dreams, and I'm here, and this is it. In the Zevely Zone, <laughs> Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. Yeah, and if you'd like to see Sarah's finished product, the Casablanca is located in Bankers Hill at 2241 4th Avenue. For more information about her art and design, visit the Zevely Zone page on CBS8.com. Well, a Poway mother received a holiday surprise she never saw coming. Her homemade chocolate chip cookie business, really an overnight success. Jeff now introduces us to the makers of Oli's Cookies. In order to be a great chef and even better mother, sometimes you need to write your own recipe. Yeah, it's time to start baking. <laughs> Laura Bach is a stay-at-home mom. Today I'll be baking um, 460 cookies. But the cookies she's crafting are leaving her home by the thousands. You know, I mean, I'm doing it for him. I'm doing it for us. Laura graduated from the San Diego Culinary Institute and was working in high-end restaurants until her son Ollie was diagnosed with severe autism spectrum disorder. I was shocked. I, I mean, you would think I would have noticed signs and I didn't have a clue. Ollie was three at the time. When I realized it was um, severe autism, um, it was devastating. He's now seven and in second grade. Ollie and I have been doing this single parenting for about two years now. Laura created Ollie's cookies just a few weeks ago. Can you come help mama? Customers are already ordering her plant-based chocolate chip cookies by the hundreds of dozens. 
While she bakes, Ollie draws. He doesn't say much, but his creations do all the talk. Well, Ollie is an amazing artist. Laura launched this business so she could spend more time with her son. But Hawaii is our happy place. Um, Ollie's learned to surf. I learned to surf. <laughs> when Ollie isn't in the ocean or playing soccer. Uh, this is a busy kitchen. He's his mom's yep. number one helper. How is he at making cookies? At making cookies? Well, he's better at eating them. <laughs> I'll say that. That's something we share in common. Yeah. There's only one cook in this kitchen, but on this shift, two taste testers. Mm. If you think the cookies are sweet, wait until this mother tells you about the dozens and dozens of reasons. Ollie is amazing. She wouldn't want her life any other way. I don't know what I would be doing right now without him. I mean, he's my everything. He's my purpose. In the Zevely Zone, Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. Yeah, good mama there. Laura, of course, is selling these chocolate chip cookies and throughout the holidays, her special blend with orange cranberries and chocolate chips. Once again, for more information, visit the Zevely Zone page on CBS8.com. Well, last but certainly not least, we hosted the Holiday Bowl. Petco Park was lit up Wednesday night after going dark in October following the Padres playoff run. It was the first football game at Petco Park and ended up being a huge win for businesses and college football fans who were thrilled to see crowds of people during a slow winter season, especially because last year the Holiday Bowl was canceled following coronavirus protocols. This time, over 40,000 people purchase seats to cheer for their college team. Go, baby. Let's, let's go, go. Let's, let's go. go. We're turning up today. We're getting it done. We're getting the W and we're about to dominate. We're getting that win for sure. <laughs> yes, the Holiday Bowl will return to Petco Park next year and again through 2025. The final score for this year, 28 to 27, with the Oregon Ducks beating the North Carolina Tar Heels. Well, as always, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for staying informed. Join me each week as I take you around San Diego. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take good care of yourself and may 2023 be so good to you.